Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience while I browse my computer to find my PowerPoint. OK, is everybody seeing this now? OK, so welcome everyone to Contemplative Community Week and our session on mindful listening to music. My name is John Radwin and my colleague is Dr. Jason Tram. And we're going to begin with a quotation from Arvo Part. Dr. Tram. Thank you. Arvo Part is a um, is an Estonian minimalist composer. He's currently in his 80s right now. He's still writing music. He's still active, and he innovate. He um he one of his um one of his developments is Tintin Obulations, a compositional device he uses, and on that, which is evocative of the sound of little bells. And um, in his own words, Tintin Obulation is an area I sometimes wander into when I'm searching for answers in my life, my music, my work. In my dark hours, I have the certain feeling that everything outside this one thing has no meaning. The complex and multifaceted only confuse me, and I must search for unity. What is it, this one thing, and how do I find my way to it? Traces of this perfect thing appear in many guises, and everything that is unimportant falls away. Tintinabulation is the three nodes of the triad are like bells, and that is why I call it tintinabulation. Arvo paired. Thank you so much, Jason. Our title of our talk today is Nada Brahma, Sound is God. And we're happy to share this as part of our Contemplative Community Week. And I'll just take a very brief reminder that there are still events going on today and tomorrow. So I encourage everyone to check the faculty development calendar to find the other events. I'm gonna briefly explain the Nada Brahma concept and then we'll spend some time listening together to a piece by Arvo Part. Part. So if you want to learn about Nada Brahma, uh, Berendt's book from 1983 is called Nada Brahma, The World is Sound, and that's how I first learned about this concept. But really, it's very much broader than just the world being sound. When you study the ancient Vedas and especially pay attention to the concept of Nada Brahma, what you start to find is that it has a view of the world as vibrational energy so that creation both comes out of sound and is sounding. So it's a worldview that's immaterial. Material from this perspective doesn't exist. Instead, what does exist is energy and energy in relational patterns. So when you look at the Sanskrit meanings for Nada Brahma, it's not something that's simple, like a material definition might be. Instead, it's a meaning that has multiple resonances to it. And the most prominent meaning associated with it is the title of our presentation today, Nada Brahma, Sound is God. And there's lots of different ways to think about this in different traditions. Uh, but we're a Catholic university, so I'm going to draw on the Bible for this one. So the opening to Genesis, um, you know, especially from my field as someone who has a degree in speech communication, uh, creation comes through God speaking. So I'll read Genesis uh, 1, 1 to you. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So God's creative action is speech. God calls and says light and the first day into being. Moving forward a little bit, another way, and this is the way Berendt approaches Nada Brahma, 
is to think of the world as vibrational sound. And I'm not a physicist, but I've studied a little bit about quantum physics. And similar to the ancient Vedic tradition, contemporary physicists no longer believe in matter. <laughs> Instead, matter is energy patterns. And so electrons aren't things, <laughs> they're energy and protons and so on throughout the entire universe. So while at our level, it might seem solid and material, ultimately what we're dealing with is energy patterns, the world is sounding. The third meaning is sound is joy. And this is a beautiful one. When I think of sound and joy, I think of life and how it makes noise, even if it's not trying to make noise, right? <laughs> life just hums. So uh, it makes me think of the sound of the insects or, nature's or the nature or the hum of the city. Um, and that's a joyous living sound. The fourth meaning is that sound is emptiness. And so the Nada Brahma tradition here makes me think of how sound is, uh, of all the arts, the most immaterial, right? So you're listening to my voice right now, and sure, there's a ton of technology involved, but all it really comes down to is vibrating air. And especially in musical traditions, those vibrations are careful compositions to invite people into emptiness, yet emptiness filled with creative energy. The fifth way to think about it is to think about Nada Brahma telling you that sound is the central concept. It's the idea that will help you interpret really everything. And so I don't know if other people talk about it this way, but I talk about reality as an aural experience. So our reality, where we're sensitivity is listening. It's directing attention toward and focusing on and really our reality comes into being as we focus on it and, and with this concept especially as we listen to it as we listen to god as we listen to the world as we listen to the joyful hum of life and as we listen to the vibrating emptiness of sound in air so this is very abstract so we're going to bring it back to arvo pert with uh, Dr. Tram telling us a little bit about contemplative listening and how it works in the sacred minimalist tradition, and then especially how it works with Arvo Pert in his song, Spiegel im Spiegel. Thank you, John. Uh, Dr. Adwan, appreciate that very much. And um, <clears throat> with a composer like Arvo Pert, I just, I'll, I'll just say a few words about who he is. Uh, in, from 2011 to 2018, he was the most performed living composer in all of classical music. In 2019, he was supplanted by John Williams as the second. So that's the impact that this man has had and his work has had on the, um, the world music community. And it's kind of fascinating because he grew up in Estonia under Soviet oppression. And um, as a Christian, he was fiercely oppressed. And he had to discover what his voice was. So when he first started writing music, he wrote in the music of um, kind of that he was surrounded by. And when he started writing serial music, um, uh, uh, fiercely chromatic music, um, like Schoenberg in that in that that camp, the Soviet he ran afoul of the Soviet censors. So he was kind of banished from the concert halls of his Estonia, which devastated him. So for eight years, he um, he didn't write a note. He um, put himself into like self isolation and just thought about music. And um, it was when he came into touch with early polyphony and Gregorian chant that his music that he found his voice again. And um, he, he put aside the fierce chromaticism and all this music, and he found this kind of, this idea of tintinobulation in 1976, where he wrote Für Alina, which is a piece for piano. And um, he discovered this in the, the, this, this tintinobulation device, which is triadic uh, in one voice, and then another voice has diatonic scale melodies. 
And um, this ringing of bells in the triad against the scale patterns um, is just a device he created and something that, that fired up his imagination. Since then, over the last 40 years or so, he has adapted it to full-length symphonies, concertos, um, sacred choral music. I did a couple of his pieces at Seton Hall in my tenure, and I just love the students were stunned. We did one piece uh, called the Staban Mater for the... Um, uh, for the Lenten meditation a couple of years ago. And the entire piece is an F minor triad for 23 minutes, but it never gets boring or dull and it's incredibly complicated. So within, like, like the uh, the Sanskrit resonances, it's not easy to define this concept. Well, it sounds very easy in an application. It's quite challenging. But um, for me personally, um, during COVID, and I was writing my tenure dossier and uh, just absorbed in this uh, very, very challenging time period, um, think about a musical artist. Um, as a conductor, I spend most of my time in front of people making music and um, guest conducting and doing lots of, um, you know, my teaching. And, and I spend most of my time, probably eight, ten rehearsals a week, w went all to Zoom. And in that, I, I felt very isolated. I felt very alone many of the, much of the time. And the music of our parrot struck a chord with me, and I, I really focused my attention to his work. And um, I find this incredibly contemplative. Uh, he's also a very deeply religious man, and he finds, um, he finds his core in the simplicity of that. So he writes sacred music and secular music. But in this case, this is a secular piece, Spiegel im Spiegel, which means mirror in the mirror in German. And yeah, you take this infinity mirror, and this infinity mirror concept is what he, what he was writing about. Now, each reflection in the mirror isn't exactly like the other. They're slightly different. So every time he repeats this music and this phrase, it's going to be slightly different. But... Um, this is about a 10 minute piece for cello and piano. And um, I find this incredibly contemplative. Close your eyes and just feel the music. And um, this is literally the most simple piano part, but also sometimes in simplicity, we can find the most complicated. Thank you so much, Dr. Tram. I'm gonna start the song now. And as he just said, I invite everyone to close your eyes and then along with contemplative practice, strive to make the sound itself your focal point. When other thoughts or feelings or ideas come by, that, that's very natural, but try to note them and bracket them and return back to your center, which in this case is this beautiful piece, Spiegel im Spiegel.
So thank you for listening, everyone, and I hope you found it a contemplative and peaceful experience. Um, we do have time for a few questions if anybody would like to talk through uh, to just briefly conclude the Nada Brahma tradition is from ancient India and it affirms that sound is much more than you might think it is. Sound is something deeply spiritual and can even be identified with God. It can also be an understanding of how energy constitutes our physical universe. It can also point toward the joyful thrumming and humming of life. It can also point toward the uh, incredibly deep yet full emptiness of vibrating air and sound. And then lastly, you can think of it as a central concept to help you understand humanity and God and the universe. Uh, God sounds and humans as we image him also sound and uh, Arvo Pert was a wonderful example of a human sharing some beautiful sounds to allow us to get in touch with hopefully a bigger reality a vibrational energy pattern um, so thank you for listening and now let's try and do a few questions did anybody want to talk about the composition or any of the concepts from Nada Brahma Chelsea. Um, thank you so much for that. It was very, very peaceful and soothing. My question was, was there any significance to the instruments that were used in that piece? Because um, I, I don't know how to describe it, but the boom, not the boom, but the, the sound that it would periodically make was very soothing. And I wonder if there was any significance to that. I can I can bring that out. So we have two voices. You have the piano voice and the triadic playing triadic figures, and you have the cello playing the, the melodic line in uh, diatonic scale patterns, uh, very simple, slowly scale patterns. And every once in a while, the piano would add bass notes. Right, once in a while, it's very carefully placed. Um, in the wrong hands, minimalism can be dreadfully boring. In the right hands, it is uh, profoundly inspirational and just. It, it's just the the for me it's that um, the, like it's almost like meditation right it just kind of puts you in another plane and I think uh, Parrot's music has been copied by a countless number of Hollywood composers you hear this style in um, in every television show these days you hear minimalism from Game of Thrones to whatever the how the show is and every movie this particular piece that we listen to has been used in over 20 movies 15 documentaries ballets you name it it's become so everywhere because it's um I think it's struck a chord with modern audiences because it just makes you stop it's long. It's not um, trying to be flashy. It's just, it's what it is. And I think that, you know, coming from his chromatic past and kind of discovering this kind of almost stopping the harmonic progression, it's, it's reinvented what tonality is. It's a long answer to your question. Sorry. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tram. Did anybody else have a question to share? Okay, so seeing nobody, then I'm happy to bring our event to a conclusion. Again, please remember that this is one small event within a much larger Contemplative Community Week sponsored by the Center for Faculty Development. And so I encourage everybody to visit the Faculty Development website and check out our remaining events. Uh, with this, I'm going to sign off and stop our recording. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Jason. Great. Thank you, Sean. That was yeah. lovely. Jason. Yeah. Have a great day. Okay, just leave to stop it. Bye. <laughs>